Welcome to Talking Jazz. My guest today is saxophonist, composer, educator, Lena Bloch, who talks to me from New York, but has a European background coming from Russia and being multilingual. We'll enjoy some of your music, Lena, and get to listen to it and get to talk about your really, really individual concepts on how you approach music, how you approach playing. But I think it would be important to know for everybody a little bit about your background. How, do, how did you get to the saxophone and to New York in a nutshell? Monica, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm really excited because that's my first time being with you. I'm currently in Brooklyn. I I have moved to New York in 2008, so I'm living here since 2008, and I came to the United States in 2003 for my graduate studies at the University of Massachusetts for composition and African-American music. I was born in Moscow, and then gradually I got into music because both my parents were pian pianists, and they had a huge jazz collection at home. They still do, and I was listening to this music since I was a child. I remember but I guess also when I was a little baby or even not yet born something like that I got into music first of all playing piano and as a kid then I quit as many kids do and then I got back to it when I was in high school playing guitar and I became a singer songwriter I wrote my own songs and I wrote songs on other poetry that I loved and I performed them extensively I participated in all the kinds of competitions and gatherings as a singer songwriter and also then I got into jazz singing and started to transcribe solos that I knew already by ear from previous listening, but I was transcribing instrumental solos and vocalists like Billie Holiday, Sarvon, Ella Fitzgerald, my favorite. So then I was 18 years old, I think, by then I started singing a classical opera and I got into very famous opera school in Moscow and studied there for two years. It was a very high soprano voice. So with all that, I played guitar, I was a singer, I was a singer-songwriter, I wrote for theater a lot and I was acting. That continued and continued until one day I was just thinking about I need a saxophone. I do not know why because I have not heard any particular saxophone players except Lester Young who impressed me so much that I would want to become like them. I thought about it. It happened to me often since then that I'm thinking about something I jump up and I go and I do it and that is life-changing for some reason something pushes me to do it and I'm not sure what it is I got up I went and I bought a saxophone I started learning by myself because a friend of mine bought a saxophone a week ago so he taught me the fingering and that continued for a year or so started playing we had like a community I was already in the jazz school because of my vocal efforts, so I became a saxophone player, out of vocalist, so I was admitted to a small jazz school. It's like a college, but it is not really a college, it is more like a community college, perhaps. So I studied there for a year with, with one teacher on, on saxophone, and then because I was growing up that fast, I was very demanding. I really wanted to practice. I practiced up to 12 hours a day, very long, doing nothing thing at all besides. That. I wanted to study more and I, I went to Lenin's library. I studied all the books that they had. I turned, because of no copy machine, I copied everything by hand. So I had lots of books, lots of materials. Then one day I was thinking that I want more and I want to play more with different people. It was not quite possible in Moscow because uh, you know, Russia as a country is not very well connected. Like for example, if you are in Europe, in Germany, or oh, France is close, okay, Italy is nearby, Switzerland is there. In Russia, it's not that. So I decided to, I want to go abroad, but unfortunately that was Soviet Union. We could not go abroad at all unless we are kicked out completely. I had to apply, immigrate to Israel. That was the only way one could, one could leave in the 90s. I think it was 1990. I officially immigrated to Israel and my citizenship, they took away my Soviet citizenship because I was like a traitor. I was not alone, <laughs> there were many others, but I guess perhaps 
I was the only one who did it because I wanted to study jazz. And in Israel, I went to Rubin Academy of Music and Dance, and I studied there for a year. And then the Gulf War started. I had to leave. Fortunately, I had a friend in Holland who said I could stay with them. So I escaped the country, and that's how I got to Europe. And then I, later on, I got to Germany in the early 90s and graduated from the Cologne Music Hochschule, which was artist diploma. I think it's equivalent to master's because bachelor's something. I don't think we have it in Germany, bachelor degree. The conservatory in German means very, very high level uh, institution. It's not like a child conservatory in America. It means actually something like graduate studies. To be admitted to conservatory, you already how to be someone I competed with 23 people I'm not joking 23 people and they only took two I was one of them one for tenor sax and one for alto sax you know your whole story it's it's, it's like a novel I'm, I'm just listening yeah, I know. it's like a crazy crazy fiction novel and but it's reality you know I think we should definitely continue that story because we're not at the end yet but let's throw a piece of music in and then let's continue this story so we'll pick up from Cologne after this let's listen to this first song which is Esme and is it from your Hard Nose album? Yes it's uh, one of the Hard Nose songs the album was released in 2017 on Fresh South New Town and the song is about two of my Persian friends in Cologne that I met. I was very involved in with a lot of Iranian Persian people. Uh, there was like two such beautiful spiritual beings that I wanted to write a song about them and I, that's what I did. Well, perfect. So here, right at the Cologne story, this is right. about... That's from there, yeah. Some of the people you met there. All right, so here's Esme by my guest today, Lena Bloch, on, and you can hear her on saxophone, and you'll hear Russ Slossing on piano and Cameron Brown on bass and Billy Mintz on drums from her 2017 Hard Nose release.
oftentimes, you know, I'm wondering about this balance between inner urge, talking about Joe Henderson, thank you, inner desire and your connections to other people. It is not like your true connection to other people, your responsibility to your loved ones and your desire are not at the same time. They are not simultaneous. Like, for example, if I feel I have to do something, I have to think about who are around me. That is not so because, first of all, by doing what I'm pushed to do from within, I serve them but not now, later. So that's a really interesting concept. Yeah, you have yeah. to leave the things behind and don't do your obligation to be better later at serving and, and putting that together. Yeah, for example, I can I can speak about my parents because certainly when I made this decision, even when I made the decision to play saxophone, my parents were already like this. It's hard to have a kid at home who practices 12 hours a day with horrible noise. It didn't sound like music for a beginner. They already put up with this. They said, don't come home with this thing. Go away and do not come back. Once they really kicked me out, and so I had to live with friends for a while. So they were not happy with it at all. So then when I told them that I'm going to immigrate, they were saying that I'm killing them. Selfish, most egoistic, most narcissistic person, that I'm not thinking about but people who love me, people who, you know, raised me up. Now they are on a seven heaven of being happy of who I am. Now they're so proud. They're like, oh my God, you did this. Oh, we can't even imagine. How could you achieve all this? How can you speak all these languages? How can you play such great music? That's how you do it. Yeah, you have to take the step and, and usually it's it's big risk. Yes. We were in Cologne and you were just accepted to the conservatory as one of the, you yes. are on on tenor or on alto i have to on tenor i played i, played tenor. Tenor. I, thought, I yeah. just bought a tenor and i was super excited for some reason i didn't want to play alto i didn't feel right it was great but that didn't feel right to me i wanted to have this tenor sound and then well at this conservatory i was so lucky to have met John Marshall, the, the trumpeter. He was the soloing trumpeter with Ted Jones, Melilla's big band back here. We did our WDR big band in Cologne, and he was first, uh, he was my teacher, and then we became real friends and colleagues, and we started playing together also. So he's on my first ever recording that I made in Cologne, which is on my Bandcamp page. And there I also met Keith Copland, the greatest human being ever who helped me so much like he was like no one else was so dedicated to everyone that he thought is worth it supporting he sent a lot of people to new york drummers because he thought okay whatever you do in your life you have to go to new york first you have to you have to be there and you have to try to connect with people that are over there and he helped me to find a after I graduated, he helped me to find a graduate school in the United States that would accept me. He wrote to many places. He wrote to Eastman, I think. He wrote to Purchase. He wrote to like, several places. So, and then in the uh, University of Massachusetts, they got very interested and they saw my compositions because there is no jazz performance masters. You can only do composing. And then I left for uh, University of Massachusetts in 2003. But before that, in Cologne, in 2001, I met Lee Konitz, who became my mentor and friend, and I cannot even express how close he was to me as a friend, as a teacher, as a guru, perhaps, like they say, because he was a spiritual guide, first of all. So I met him in 2001, and I started with him until I left. And then, funny, but he also left and he moved to New York to his apartment so I could continue studying, <laughs> which I was with Lee until when he passed away last year. But my actual lessons and hangouts with him were approximately till like 2018. 
19. All right, we made it all the way in New to New York on your crazy yeah. journey. But yeah, what a mentor was Lee Conant. Well, I can hear it in, in some of your music, you know, the concept and the way it's, it's different. So we're going to listen to Promise of Return, which is kind of ironic too. So is there a promise of return or did you promise somebody to return on this crazy journey? This is from my album, Rose of Lifter, which was released in 2021. This year, actually in October, on Fresh Sound Records, this tune is dedicated to Palestinian march of return to many lives that were lost because of killings and everything that went along with it. I admire the courage of those people who simply have to give up their lives in order to just try to get home. And so I was thinking that in some sense we are all trying to get home someplace, which we consider our home, which is a spiritual place of our spiritual motherland, how much we have to sacrifice and how much we have to give, including our own lives, just in order to be able to move one step closer. So let's listen to that with that in mind. So this, this is brand new and really speaks to what we're going through at this time. So I just want to put it in there with no disclaimer. So this is a promise of return by my guest today, Lena Block. And it is the same personnel as the previous piece with Russell Lossing on piano, Cameron Brown on bass and Billy Mintz on drums. Here we go.
That was Promise of Return from a brand new album by my guest today, Lena Block, called Rose of Lifta. We're going to actually listen to one more from the previous album, Hard Nose. But we talked earlier how everyone has a compositional voice. 
And for yourself, you keep thinking, oh, everything sounds the same, but that's okay because it's a specific voice that you have. So tell us a little bit about your compositional concepts and, and how you approach writing music. Oh, that's a very interesting question, Monica. Thank you. Because it actually changed a lot since I began writing, which, like I said, it was certainly not jazz. It was just chanson. That's how I started thinking about creating some melodies on some meanings. This theatrical cinematic concept of making a story, like a little narrative in the sense it has characters that are moving, saying something, doing something, and that something is happening and we are witnessing all this. So that stayed with me, I think, because that, this approach of not approaching music in an abstract way, but always trying to create multi-perceptional phenomenon, which can be also heard, but you also see things and you imagine things and it sounds like a human voice or it sounds like a person saying something, feeling something like this, or, you know, more in the sense of an actor acting than in the sense of notes, sounding notes. And then I started writing. I started writing, of course, in a jazz idiom, which was you write a chorus on changes, so the harmony, and you write some melody on this harmony, and this is a chorus that people improvise on. You play the melody in the beginning, and you play the melody in the end. So that was my first try, writing like that. And then slowly, 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 I started hearing something that was not fitting. I was totally different and nobody knew how to play that. So we didn't know what to do with all this. So I thought, oh, okay, that is all garbage. Okay, fine. Then I met these people in New York, Cameron Brown and Billy Mains first, and also Dave Miller, the guitarist that was with us on my first record. And then Russ Lossing, of course. And that changed me completely in the sense that I thought, okay, well, now I can really write what I mean. So my approach to writing is basically different for different styles, different types of expression. Sometimes it is a tune with changes. Again, like Heart Knows, for example, is a ballad which I wrote initially just a melody of it without any harmony. I imagined some harmony, but there was nothing, and Russ Rose changes to it. He decided that it sounds better, like he, he worked with Paul Motion that way. Paul would write a line, and Russ would write harmony to it, which he also, of course, he could also change, and he could improvise more harmonically, and I can improvise more harmonically. This tune can be also played as a completely free tune, based on melody only without any harmony set up in advance. So there are options. Or it can be just played as a jazz as a jazz tune with chorus and solos on changes and things like traditional approach. And some tunes that I write, they have no harmony at all and the harmony is improvised when we're playing. Like Esme, for example, had no harmony, has no form either. So there's no form. Form is improvised, the harmony is improvised, and the communication between ensemble members is completely spontaneous. We never rehearse, actually. We never get together. We don't have arrangements. We just set up here is the tune and whatever we can do with it. So the tunes are more or less improvisation vehicles. The more flexible, the more open it is, the better it is for, for the overall sound because people are, do not get mechanical they do not get automatic well i think that's a good way to go listen to the next one hard nose and i'm glad we have the different comparisons of the three approaches from having the confinement of harmonies to opening it up to everything improvised and it's a fascinating mm -hmm. concept and but it's you know it, it, it's also daunting sometimes people think you just make things up and do something but it's actually harder to play without boundaries and, and to listen so intently that it makes sense 
than just I've, to go through changes and all that, right? I think it it truly really depends on who is doing it and whether people are ready to do that. Because honestly, when I went with concerts to Moscow, I have met many young guys who were completely fascinated and they said, yeah, we have to do it right now. We have to do the same thing right now. And they said, well, not unless you have 50 years of experience. I'm not saying that everyone has to have lifelong experience of playing before starting doing it but it is absolutely necessary to be culturally ready because it's just the same thing with everything if you're a poet and you want to write free verse for example you have to know how to do the basics and go through and be able to be creative and super flexible and spontaneous within basic limitations or the same with painting for example you can write you can paint abstract paintings but only after you already studied and went through i mean rejecting boundaries means having them first without you knowing boundaries you cannot reject anything yeah, right that's a good point so yeah, let's let's have a listen. We'll we'll keep exploring this more because this is all very very fascinating. So this is Hard Nose. It's it's a beautiful, gorgeous ballad. This is from the Hard Nose album, 2017, with Russ Lossing on piano and Cameron Brown on bass and Billy Mintz on drums. Thank you. 
This was Hard Nose composition and also heard on saxophone, my guest today, Lena Bloch. We talked about displacement, what it means to lose, to lose homes. And, and I love what you said about everybody having lost a place, a space that we had before, but we still need to forward and, and create those new spaces. You know, when I hear people telling me, let's go back to, you know, before the pandemic and how it was and keep saying, well, we were never going back. It'll, it'll be a new path, a new hole. Where's your next steps? What, what are you moving towards? Okay, Monica. Yeah, that's very beautiful. Is said. Yeah, that's the situation we are in. I'm trying to create a new compositional cycle that one is related to one poet one russian poet that had very deep meaning to me in mm -hmm. russian of course because i know this poet since i was a child in my high school her name is marina Tsvetaeva, and she is super famous in europe especially in france in america people know very little about her and i could hardly find translations I only found one book of translations of her poetry, which I am now searching. What I would like to do, I would like to write a few songs after her poems with singing, with vocals, I mean, for real. And I would probably rework the translations so they resemble, they resemble her rhythmic approach more because you see in Russian, her poetry is super rhythmic and very angular, not symmetrical in in the in the metric sense. To put her poems in Russian into jazz, into improvising context would be much easier. However, not understood by English speaking universe. I have to rework the translations a little bit so they're not quite literal but at the same time closer to the meaning of her poems. And then, well, I already have musicians in my mind to work with, and I spoke to them. One of them is the great singer Kyoko Kitamura. She will be the singing voice. I hope that this project, we applied for some funding, and I hope we can get at least some of it, hopefully. That's super difficult. I know how many, how many people want to do Art. so many things it seems like right now it the competition has actually exploded you know it was hard before but mm -hmm. now where everybody's uh, resources are tight i mean it just blows uh, my mind that how many for each of these opportunities are applying and all with great things it just seems like there's something completely off balance with that right now i totally agree because on one hand it is of course we're super fortunate to be able to apply for some things like that like grants and opportunities which russian people don't have for example, in Russia, they do not have the system of grants. If you want to do something on your own, you are on your own. But here we have so many opportunities. We can do this and this and this and this. But on another hand, the fact that the state does nothing at all, that bothers me, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure how, how that should happen, but... I'm thinking that if a musician or let's say a painter or a writer has to work on something for a while, it is obvious that he will not generate any income. Work, output, money. <laughs> but not not in arts. In arts, it doesn't work. So the outcome of this crazy situation is that everyone needs funding to be able to do anything at all. Because how else? Trust the artist and trust what comes out that it will benefit you and everybody else and and the greater good and and it's worth supporting so fun talking to you oh, and man. getting yeah, into all you. these concepts you know we would we would have to do this for weeks and weeks to, <laughs> to get to the bottom of it i i feel like i feel totally unleashed because <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't spoken to a human being about it for so long oh my gosh we all need to <laughs> be unleashed so fun, yeah but we got one last selections, which is Moonier. This one is from your hard nose release from 2017. Yeah. So thank you, Lena. Again, we'll we'll take it out on Moonier. This is Lena Block, composition, saxophone, with her incredible band, Russ Lossing on piano, Cameron Brown on the bass, Billy Mintz on, on the drums. 
And here we go.
Thank you for listening to Talking Jazz today. My guest was composer, educator, saxophonist, Lena Bloch. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana or online at wetfthejazzstation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.